Good evening, everybody. Everybody good? Who's happy to be in church on a Wednesday night? All right, all right. Grab your Bibles with me tonight. We're going to uh, jump into our study number four in our Faith in Motion series. And uh, we'll go first to Hebrews chapter 12, and then we'll go to Genesis chapter 15. And uh, I've given you a lot, but I, I really want you to get your Bibles open. Bring your Bibles to these. I know you always do, probably, I guess, maybe. But bring your Bibles. Make sure you get those open. And you can take notes. There's a notebook there for you if you want that. And, uh, but I always want you to engage in, uh, in the Scriptures. It's, it's going to be, um, be good for you to, to get those uh, note pages out. Of course, we want to we wanna begin tonight with prayer. And uh, we're going to go to Hebrews 12. You can see it in your notes. And then Genesis chapter 15. And then we'll go through Genesis 16. And we'll go through uh, several passages of Scripture there tonight as we talk about Sarah. We look at, at, at different uh, characters in, in the Bible and what they teach us. And so we're talking about faith in, in motion, following in the footsteps of biblical greats. Not really great people in the sense that they're beyond us and we can never measure up or anything like that. Or they're ordinary people, but... They did extraordinary things because the, the real hero in all of their stories is what God did and uh, what they allowed God to do in their lives. And so as we go to the Lord in prayer, obviously, uh, we want to continue to pray for anyone in the path of the hurricane that's just going to do whatever it's going to do there in Florida. And so we've been praying today, some of us have been praying today that the Lord would just, just, just calm that storm down. I mean, he's a miracle worker, so we, we'll pray that God would just, um, I know it's natural, but he controls it, right? That's supernatural when God steps in. And uh, so we have friends, Holly and I have friends, probably some of you do too. I think everybody knows somebody in Florida. They're just, you know, and uh, so uh, pastor friends that are right there in Tampa and, and all down that coast and uh, friends who are on the other coast and in the middle and Orlando and all that area. And so we want to pray for them and the people that either decided not to evacuate or just couldn't. You know, we want to pray for them. And then certainly all the cleanup and the stuff from uh, the last uh, hurricane and in North Carolina and Tennessee, the southwestern part of Virginia. And so you, you guys have given, don't, don't hold me to the number, I don't have the number in front of me. But it's, uh, it's a little over $20,000 now that you've given. And, of course, those resources are, you know, God's Pit Crew, Operation Compassion. And you could go Google any of those. God's Pit Crew has been on the ground. They're still there, Florida and Georgia, and they're just all over the place and such incredible organizations. And then if you'll notice what Jason uh, told you all at the end of Sunday, if you don't know about it, make sure you get a little flyer. They're up on those high-top tables when you leave tonight up in the main foyer. Uh, just look for one of the black high top tables and grab the, the little flyer that's on top of it. Uh, our intention is to get teams together and respond as a church. So those who want to go, we have about 60 who have, who have said they would love to do it. And uh, here's what we do, though. And, and I, I, did this, I did this for years where we were before. We worked with God's Pit Crew uh, pretty exclusively. We did some things with Operation Compassion, but God's Pit Crew and the Convoy of Hope and, and other Samaritan's Purse and all of these incredible organizations. And, uh, but here's what I like for us to do as a church. And I learned this from the people that are in these organizations. You know, there's always this huge influx, thankfully, of cash and resources, like we're packing the truck. And uh, David Gum at White House Apple is, g gave us the truck and we're gonna pack it. So we're, we're, we're working together with them. We've had volunteers here yesterday, today. I think that's tomorrow as well. And, uh, it's going. It's just going splendid. It's just amazing what people are bringing. People from all over the community are bringing things, and so those. those and that's going to go to God's Pit Crew, and they'll disperse it. And uh, they're just top-notch people. I know Randy Johnson, who is the founder and the president, and Randy's a fine man, incredible. And they're they're based out of uh, Danville, Virginia. But here's what Randy taught me. You know, you get this huge influx of cash and resources that you need, and then when it comes to the real cleanup, like where you're you're actually getting the house cleaned out so you can now come in and begin to rebuild and do that that's where it begins to wane and the resources kind of lack in those two phases and so i always thought well if, if that's what the if that's what the people who are in it are telling us then it, i want i want to pastor and be the people that come in in phase two and phase three and kind of kind of be strong stepping in and so we're going to do that and we've got uh, we've got some folks in our church that are trained with organizations they're trained and uh, one of them as a trainer will be finished with some training in a new organization in November. We'll tell you all about it. But uh, but organization that'll 
keep us warm or, or cool whatever we need and feed us and be able to get into these areas working with local governments and, and be able to get in and do the muck out, what's called the muck out, and then the rebuild. And what that means is we won't be just delivering goods and supplies, which is what's needed. That's, that's wonderful. But we'll actually get to connect with the people. We'll get, we'll get to be hands and feet with the people, the families, and, and, and really, really do some really cool things to help people get back on their feet. So that's pretty cool. And there's plenty of time. I know we've kind of feel this rush and we want to respond. And we, we have wonderfully. You have been so generous and so kind. And then on top of the cash that you've given, the supplies that you've given, you've been so wonderful, so amazing. And, uh, and so we've already responded, and we've responded really, really well with serious dollars and resources. But then we're going to be able to, to step in and do some kind of roll up our sleeves and get our feet wet and help people and take them by the hand. That'll be good, won't it? Won't that be fun if you can do that? Love for you to do that. And some of you won't be able to do it, but you've given, you've given supplies, and it, that's, all, that's all part of it. And I, I'm just I'm so thankful. But we want to pray tonight. I spent more time talking about that than I probably needed to, but I, I'm so excited about our response and how we get to help people. And it's just beautiful when a community comes together, isn't it? And uh, the, the people are good. I don't know what, I don't, if you watch the news all the time, we're supposed to hate each other and fight and fuss and we don't get along. And that's just not true. The more people I get out and talk to, we might disagree on some things, but most, mostly people are civil. It's when you turn the news on, I think they hire people to be uncivil. And so, uh, so we're just going to love people, right? Right? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the beautiful privilege of being in a warm, cool, whatever you feel, safe environment tonight. Uh, that we're not worried about wind speed or storm surge, and I, I'm thankful for that, but we have brothers and sisters and people that are lost and hurting and broken, Lord, who are in the path of this great storm, and I pray that you would cause the storm to be um, slowed down, that you, uh, God, I would ask you to do a miracle, Lord. I, I wouldn't mind, Lord, if you just went ahead and stopped the whole thing, and Lord, I, I know that these are natural things and this is a part of the times in which we live. But Lord, I just pray that you would protect and help and keep. And Lord, the people that are cleaning and working and involved in the cleanup in southwestern Virginia and Tennessee and North Carolina, down into Georgia and, and Father, down into Florida. I, I just pray that you would uh, keep them safe and help them and cause things to be expedited as we send supplies. Lord, if you can multiply a little boy's lunch to feed thousands and thousands of people, Lord. You can multiply supplies to meet the needs of the people. And we just, uh, we thank you, Lord, that we have the privilege and the wonderful opportunity to give, to be the extension of the hands and the feet of Jesus. And Lord, as we give, we give in your name, Lord, and what we want, uh, nothing in return for ourselves, Lord. We want people to find you, to know you, uh, to regain their footing in their families and their life and their homes, Lord. We want the very best for them. And Lord, on top of that, we want more than anything for them to come to a saving knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. So as folks are working and giving water and helping with clothing and all of those things, food and everything else, may the gospel be proclaimed in the lives of those who are there. We thank you for our time together tonight as we open the word of God. Would you speak to us? May the Holy Spirit be our teacher and our guide, we pray. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Together, everyone said amen. Amen. All right, we started in each of these sessions, we started with the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. That passage is there for you on the screen. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. This cloud of witnesses, these biblical greats, these people, these characters, the Bible is filled with characters. Hebrews chapter 11 kind of is known as the hall of faith, but the Bible is filled with all kinds of characters that loved God and served God. And we get to see the whole of their story, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Sometimes David comes to mind there. We get to see all of David's life. But this idea of this cloud of witnesses is telling us that we can run this race, that if we did it, you can do it too. They teach us something. And so tonight we're going to look at, at the life of Sarah. So we'll, we'll turn here to Genesis chapter 15. And we begin there in verse 1, Genesis chapter 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Now, let me just pause there. You probably know this, but Abram and Sarai were their names, and God changed their name to Abraham and Sarah. Uh, Abram means um, like exalted father, right? So, so he's uh, an, an exalted father. You hear it. That's kind of um, like a singular family, but Abraham 
means the father of many nations, the father of multitude. That's his calling. That's who God saw him as. Not just as a man that might have a son, but as a man that would have many sons. Anybody grow up singing that song, Abraham, right? Father Abraham had many sons. The rest of you are like, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Then Sarai, Sarai means princess, as if, it's, as if she is a ruler in one family, a princess. But Sarah means a princess of nations, of the multitude. Again, God changes their name to reflect the calling, what he sees in them. Uh, and, and I don't want to get too detailed in the, in the Hebrew or the words or anything like that, but it has been suggested that when God adds the letters to their name to create Abraham and create Sarah, that it is, it is as though God is putting himself in that name. Well, that's not strange to me because the more we follow God, the more we look like God, right? The more we become like Jesus and the more he makes us into, into his son. So, so we, we, we pick up there again. After this, uh, or therefore, or I'm sorry, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I am childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And, Ab- and Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. And then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir. This man will not be your heir. I'm trying to keep up on iPad, sorry. <clears throat> but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up to the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So, so God comes to Abram and says, I'm going to give you a child. And well, well you know, God, you, you haven't given us a child and uh, I have a servant by the name of Eleazar, and he's going to be my heir. And God, uh, you, haven't, uh, you haven't given me a son, so how am I going to be what you've called me to be? And God tries to illustrate it to him. God t- takes him outside and says, I want you to look up at the stars, and I want you to count them. And if you can count them, then you'll get a good idea of how many offspring you're going to have. And of course, God even says, count them if you can. <laughs> the point is, you can't, Abram. I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to do this. And, and I, I, think, I think as God tried to help Abram understand, sometimes he comes to help us understand. And what we have to do is we have to learn what, what Sarah is going to teach us out of her impatience is the value of patience. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like that word, patience. I'm not, I'm not patient. And, and Holly's here tonight, but don't ask her any questions. I'm not patient. I'm impatient. And, and I know the Bible says that, that, that patience is a, a work, a fruit of the Spirit, that it is a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I'm also aware that the Bible says that it's tribulation that brings patience. So anytime I ask God to make me patient, I say, but be real gentle with me, okay? Just be gentle. Um, but, but Sarah gets impatient. And, and to make a, a long story short, she gets impatient because God makes this promise and they get excited uh, but it's 25 years before God makes good on his promise. <laughs> that's a long time. That's, it's not 25 days or 25 months. That's 25 years before God makes good on his promise. And so what happened in the waiting, she became very impatient. Abraham did as well. But she became very impatient, and she has a servant by the name of Hagar that, that somehow she had this idea that it would be good for her husband to sleep with her servant and have a child through the servant, and this surrogate would give them a child. I don't know, I don't know at, at any level how the three of them thought, this is such a great idea. Now, Hagar is a servant, so the truth is she really didn't have a choice. Boy, that's, a, that's, a, that's another story, isn't it? And, and so in, in her impatience, they get ahead of God and, and they create calamity. Listen, our impatience with God, if we're not careful, if we're not patient with God, our impatience can lead us to make decisions and choices that create a whole lot of pain in our lives. If God has given a promise, God will fulfill his promise. But he's going to do it in his time. And, and, and of course... You know, the, the whole story we know, probably most of you in the room know that the story there is, well, this child that's born to Hagar and, and Abraham is Ishmael, the, the, the kind of the progenitor of the Arab nation. And, and there, there's been nothing but conflict 
for, for generations, nothing but war and conflict and hatred. And you're, you're watching it even now on the news. And, and so it, it, it caused such a calamity. And so in your notes there, if you see your note page, for when you can't understand, I think her story, she teaches us, for when you can't understand God and impatience threatens to overwhelm you, don't complicate God's promise with your solution. Okay, I, I know you, I, I, I can't put this on you. I want to. So I'll just say me, okay? It'll help everybody in the room feel better. There are times, I, this is going to shock you. There are times when I think I know better than God. Now, I know you're way more saved than I am. You're closer to heaven than I am. He loves you way more than he loves me. But there are times that I, I think... I could figure this out a little better. We could do this quicker. I could, this, this is what needs to happen. Anybody else? I don't want to be out here all alone by myself, right? All right, the whole room, all right? I threatened to preach on hell last week, so I, I can come back to that. So for when you can't understand God and impatience threatens to overwhelm you, don't complicate God's promise with your solution. So Sarah would say to us, you're going to have to trust God. Now, trust means to lean on, and you don't lean on something that you don't trust. Like, like, I'm not going to lean on this. There's a good reason. I'm not going to, you don't lean on this. Now, I can lean on the brick wall over there, but I can't lean on this because I'm going to fall over. And if I fall over, you're not going to help me. You're going to laugh at me. You may come to help me, but you're going to laugh at me first. But you don't lean on what you don't trust. And so the, that's why the Bible says that those who, those who know your name, God, put their trust in you. Those who know your name, who know you, know your character, know your abilities, will put their trust in you. And Sarah teaches us, in, in no uncertain terms, that if we get impatient with God, we can create some real calamity in our lives. We can create some real problems and difficulties in our life. And I, I think she would say, you know, when you need to trust God, there in your notes, if you look, even if it takes a long time. Now, her testimony would be, her testimony to us would be, hey, listen, God's going to make you this amazing promise, and then he's going ha- to act like he has all the time in the world to make it happen, because he does. You and I are interested in the product, right? That's why we buy microwaves. That's why we buy Keurigs, which is not really coffee. I hate to be the one to tell you that, but that's not real coffee, but that's another lesson for a different time. But, but because we want it fast. We want it instant, right? And, and, and so, so someone, I don't even remember who said it, or I'd give them credit for it, but someone said, you know, we're into microwaving, but God's into crock potting. He's just going to slow cook it. Like, and he's going he's to put it on low. He's not even going to put it on high. Or, or he's just going to put it on warm. And he's going to take his time because God, God is never worried about producing. Like God isn't worried about what's going to happen at the end. God is into process. And you and I miss it. We miss it when we get out of the process. We just want to, we want the finished thing. We want God to be done. We want to be where we need to be. And we, we, and we mess up the process. And God's just saying, if you'll stay in the process, I'll do the product. Like Holly and I were talking about something recently, and she said, well, you know, you know God, God's going to take care of this. And, that, and I said, you know, I've never worried about God's part. It's my part. I'm a little worried about me, right? And so, so she would say to us that even if it takes a long time, you're going to have to trust God. Look at Genesis 16, verses 1 uh, through two here. Now, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Now think about that for a moment. She, she says, the Lord has kept me from, from, from giving children. So go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Do you hear her words? I can do this. The Lord did this to me. Now, in, when, when we get impatient, when we get impatient, we'll begin to, we'll, we'll begin, the enemy will get involved in that impatience and we'll begin to come, we'll begin to think of things in our mind that aren't true. She, she didn't, she not only had a bad idea, go sleep with my servant. That's a bad idea on any given day. She, she, and, and maybe I can build a family through that. You know, it's not how that works, Sarah. I mean, that's, that's not even common sense. But she's desperate, she's impatient, but she had bad theology too. She had a bad understanding of who God is. The Lord has kept me from having a baby. As if God did that to her. Now suffering and calamity in this world and even things that we go through that are very hard and very difficult is not a commentary on God. It is a commentary on the fallenness of humanity. We suffer in this world because of sin and not God's. 
It's human sin, and sometimes it's not even your sin and my sin. It's Adam and Eve's sin that we're still paying for, where the earth itself is travailing and groaning. And I, I, I don't want to get political or anything like that, but, but this whole idea of global warming and, and, and the, the, the elements and the, the, you know, the earth, and all, we, need to, we have to be good stewards of it because God gave it to us. It's his creation. And we should be really good stewards and do things really well but, but I don't struggle with, is it climate, is it, is it, or, or, or the ice caps melting, all that. I, I would say they are because the Bible tells us the closer we get to the end of the age, the earth itself is travailing and groaning. I think these storms are intensifying and things are happening. It, it, it's not that it's just happening new. This isn't the first hurricane we've had in Florida. This isn't the first time storms have come one on top of the other. But it, 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 this was flooding like we've never seen. And I'm not trying to stuff a current event in a scripture. I don't need you to hear me say that. But we are watching intensity rise, are we not? The hatred, the division in our nation, the political divide, all of that kind of stuff. We're watching it unfold. And, and we can get bad ideas of who God is and what God is doing. And so she said, since the Lord has kept me, the Lord made her a promise. He made her a promise, but she says, it's taken God too long, so God isn't doing it right, so I'm going to have to step in, and I'm going to build it myself. That's dangerous. And so, so she would teach us, though, you're, you're going to have to trust God. I'm going to have to trust God, even if it takes a long time. Here's another one. You're going to have to trust God. When you want to take it into your hands and make it happen yourself, like she said, I'll build it myself, you're going to have to trust God even if it seems ridiculous. I hate to be the one to tell you that. Even if it seems ridiculous. It's, this, is, this is absurd, right? So, so, so God isn't going to abide by our wisdom. So listen, if you, and I do believe that most of the time, most of the time, and so it, this is all of us. I'm not going to say you. This is all of us. I think sometimes we want, our, we want our relationship with God. So we want Christianity. We want our relationship with God and all that we experience with God. We want it all tucked in, nice and neat. We want to be able to figure it out. And we Americans in our Western mind and our Western thinking, we want everything on this linear line of thought. Like we want to know when it begins, when's halftime, and when does it end. And we want to be able to mark out every step along the way. And if it doesn't work on that timeline, we think this is just crazy. It's so chaotic, but the rest of the world doesn't work like that. And God doesn't work like that. God's not going to work on our timeline. And he's not going to give us a relationship with him that's all tucked in. I will tell you why. Because God will do some bizarre things. He will take the, he will take the weak and overtake the mighty. He'll take foolish things and confound wise. God will take the weak and, make, and take the mighty. He'll take the foolish and confound the wise. I mean, God does things that defy human logic. God doesn't work according to my plan. He doesn't work according to your plan. The prophet says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so is his ways above our ways and his thoughts above our thoughts. God doesn't do it the way we want. And if we want a relationship with God that's kind of all tucked in, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll miss the supernatural in our lives. We'll miss God doing something that we say, I can't explain it. But that's what he did. I, 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 don't know, I, don't know how to, I don't know. I don't know how to happen. But man, God did a miracle. Anybody a recipient of a miracle from God? Beyond sitting here tonight and being saved? Anybody had a physical healing from God in your life? I have. So, so, so we would miss the, the miraculous. We'll, we'll miss the supernatural if we just want everything to be nice and neat and tucked in. But that's not how God works. So when you're tempted to take things into your own hands, she would say to us, even when it seems ridiculous, you're going to have to learn to trust God because God isn't going to do it your way. He's not going to do it my way. So let's look at Genesis chapter 18 there. Now, remember, we read Genesis 15. That's where we started. Then we jumped down to Genesis 16. So, so from Genesis 15 to Genesis 16, God made the promise in 15. Well, he's not coming through. So in 16, she says, well, we'll just do it my way. And Genesis chapter 18. Now, 15, 16, 17, 18. That's, that's, just a, that's just a few chapters, but that represents 25 years. That's a long time. And God comes again, Genesis 18, beginning of verse 10. Then one of them, because there are three angels there, one of them is the angel of the Lord, said to them, one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. Three angels, right? Let me give you a little context there. You, you probably know this, but three angels are visiting Abram. One of them is the angel of the Lord. It's a pre-incarnate image of Jesus. Same, same angel of the Lord that wrestled with Jacob. We studied that, right? 
when, when this happens and there's a, a, a meal prepared, given, remember this angel, the angel of the Lord disappears and the other two angels are sent over to rescue Lot out of Sodom. Okay? So they're at the tents of Abram, Abraham and he says, the Lord says, I will surely return to you about this time next year and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent which was behind him. Abram, Abraham and Sarah were already very old. So, so 25 years ago, we may have had a shot at this. But Abraham is 100, and she's 90. And they're, they're very old, they said. And Sarah was past the age of childbearing. I, I bet. I've never met a 90-year-old who said, I can't wait to have a baby. <laughs> so Sarah laughed. She laughed to herself. It offended God. You'll see it in a moment. Sarah laughed to herself and she thought, watch what she says, after I'm worn out. 25 years ago, you could have done this. If you'd made good on your promise then, I wouldn't be here now. But after I'm worn out, my Lord is old. If you, what she say, if you think I'm worn out, that old... Okay, right. Will I now have this pleasure, this pleasure of a baby? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? And she did it to herself. He said, why did Sarah laugh well, and say, well, I really have a child now that I'm old? She said it with an attitude. She, she was, that laughter was a, was a laugh of mocking. She's mocking God. I'm old and worn out. You can't do this now. It's beyond the ability. You didn't make good on your promise. Well, I really have a child now that I'm old. Is, um, is anything too hard for the Lord, he asks. I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Right? So, so God made this promise. So, so when God makes a promise, she's going to teach us, even when it seems ridiculous. You, you got, because if we get impatient and we start doing it our way, we're going to create a lot of problems for ourselves. Sometimes you can have this, this thing. There was something I've been working on, and I just thought, okay, this is what, this is what I'm going to do, and this, this is where it's at, and I've got people around me, we're talking, and, and, and only to say, that's not, not going to work. Right? After prayer and working and figuring it out, you know, sometimes God says, you need to wait. You need to be patient. So, and, and, and then here's, here's the other one. So she, she would say, uh, you, you need to trust God even if those around you don't. Even if those around you don't. You're going to have to trust God. Now, I'll tell you, there's a challenge that we face in this generation, this culture in which we live, and all of us face it. Maybe some of you don't. Maybe some of you are way wiser than the rest of us. But anybody that has a smartphone, uh, you're, you're dealing with an, an addictive device. And there's so many voices, so many voices that have opportunity to speak to us. News and influencers and all, this, all these other things. Uh, they're just times, in, in fact, I, d I don't do a lot of engagement on social. You're not, you're not gonna find me there, and I've told people before, I don't, I don't pastor Facebook, I pastor you, I'm here. I'm not on Facebook tonight, I'm here, right here with you. I'm gonna stand on stage on Sunday, probably be the last one to leave the building, I'll probably be the last one to leave tonight. Among the last, why? Because I'm with you right now, I'm here, this is what I do. Now, I don't mind being on social. I think we could use it and do it well, and I want to do it even better. But sometimes I just can't handle it. I, just, I need to get off of it because I, I, I can't take all that other stuff speaking. I, I'll get my news, and you can get that in about 10 minutes, by the way. After 10 minutes, they'll start repeating the same thing, and then they're real slick about it. They'll just invite brand new people on the next hour to say the same thing the last people said, but they look different, right? Okay, you don't, you don't believe me. You need, to, you need to watch what you're watching. And so, so all these voices, social media, all these other things, I'm not throwing off on, I'm just saying we've got to be careful that with all the voices that have the opportunity to speak to your heart and mind, you need to make sure, I need to make sure that the number one voice is the voice of the Lord. And the primary way I'm going to get that is through His Word. 39%, the latest survey from Barna Research, reveals that 39% of Christians... 39% of born-again believers in this country have revealed they don't open their Bible at all throughout the week. 39%. So what, what is that? Then who's speaking to us? Whatever news channel we're watching. What, whatever info entertainer we like to watch. 
whatever radio program we like to listen to, whatever news outlet we follow, whatever we follow on Instagram, whatever we follow on X, whatever we follow on threads or Truth Social or whatever we follow. That's, that's the reality. And coming to church once a week ain't going to cut it. We're going to get impatient with God. We're going to create a lot of problems in our life. We need to be engaged in God's word. And even when those around us don't believe it, we need to believe God's promise for us. In Genesis 21, there in your notes, verses 6 and 7, Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. So, so she had that baby. Isaac was born. That's what Isaac means. She named him laughter. His, that name means laughter. She that's a good name. And so, so God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham and Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Why? Because God always makes good on his promise. And it's going, he's going to do it in his time. He's going to do it in the way that he chooses. Not my way, not your way. But he's going to do it in the way he chooses. But God always makes good on his promise. You know, there, there's a, a, a name for God in the scripture that, you know, he's, he's the provider. He's, he's Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, right? Jehovah. So he's, he's, he's the Lord that provides. And what it means is he's the promise keeper. God makes promises and God keeps his promises. In fact, as we study in times on Sundays, that's what God is doing. God is making good on all of the covenants and the promises that he's made. We're watching that unfold. So, so Sarah, in, in this great cloud of witnesses, if Sarah was going to say more to us about, about moving our faith forward and walking with the Lord, this idea of, of being able to, to be patient with God and trust God, even when it takes a long time, even when it seems ridiculous, or even when those around us don't, I think Sarah would say to us, in, in uh, at number one here, I think she would say to us that, that don't try to get ahead of God when he isn't moving fast enough for you. Don't, don't try and get ahead of God when he isn't moving fast enough for you. That little verse that proceeds right there in your notes, there's uh, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, 11, verse 11. It's right there before number one. You see it in your, on your note page. And, and it says that, remember, this is the hall of faith, the hall of fame of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. But, but notice how it begins. And by faith, even Sarah, <laughs> right? Because she had a lapse right? She, she got it wrong. Now, don't miss this. She got it wrong. She got impatient with God. She created a whole lot of problems for herself. We're still dealing with problems, right? But what did God do? Did God write her off? Did God take his promise from her? Did God say, you know, you acted out, you, you just royally messed up, Sarah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take what I promised back. That's not God. What did, what did God do? God made good on his promise, and he'll do the same for you and me. I've messed up before. Have you? Anybody here ever messed up? All right. There's, there's three of us, all right? All right. But don't try to get ahead of God when he isn't moving fast enough for you. So I, I'm, I'm very impatient. I wanted it yesterday, and I'm even more impatient on Interstate 81. Lord, help us now. They've even got big signs now. If you travel 81, VDOT has big signs. Nobody can read anymore. Like, like if you're not passing, stay in the right lane. That means the right lane, not your right lane, like the right lane. Just get over. If you struggle with that, I can help you. There's probably three or four of us in here tonight that could help you with that. Right? I'm very impatient. Holly has to tell me, don't just stop. Just go pray. That's what she says sometimes. Just go pray. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow. The Lord is not slow keeping his promises as some understand slowness. And, and I won't ask you to respond, but just in your own heart and your mind, maybe some of you have been waiting a long time. Maybe some of you are at the 25-year mark. You're waiting on a promise. Maybe some of you are 35 years or 40 years. Maybe some of you are five years or five months or two weeks. You're waiting on God. You're waiting. And the Bible says here that God isn't slow like we consider slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God isn't slow. So what's the secret? What's the secret of, of patience. The secret of patience is doing something else while you're waiting. It's, 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 it's making this decision that while I'm waiting on God, I'm going to do something. And, and she would teach us that what we do matters, right? So Psalm 37 verse 7 there in your notes. I think this is a good one from the New Living Translation. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Do not worry about evil people 
who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. So there are two things right there. It's not in your notes, but you can write these two down. I think Psalm 37 verse 7 gives us two things that we can do when we're waiting and we become impatient. We say, okay, I'm impatient. What can I do? Number one, worship, worship. Be still in his presence and wait patiently for him to act. Worship, worship God. The second thing we can do is don't worry about what's going on with everybody else. Don't worry what they say. Don't worry what's going on. This is between you and God, not everybody else. Worship and don't worry about what other people say or what they do. You with me? You with me? Number two, I think she would say to us, when you must wait, focus on what's happening in you, not what's happening to you. That's hard, isn't it? <laughs> like, like when it's happening to me, it, it's like one guy said, you know, uh, minor surgeries when it's you and major surgeries when it's me, right? So, so it, 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 sometimes it's, it's, it's hard because we're thinking, okay, I, I know God wants to do something in me, but this, this feels like he's doing it to me. This feels like this is, this is happening. And I want you to listen to something that I want to tell you. If there is something happening to you right now, any part of your life, if there's something happening to you, I promise God wants to do something in you. I promise. What I didn't say is God is creating what's happening to you. That could, be, that could be my own choices. It could be the consequences of my decisions or my choices. It could be something somebody else is doing. It could be the consequences of living in a fallen, broken world. It could be the consequences of getting ahead of God and doing it my way and not doing what God has asked me. It could be any number of things that I just outlined. But if something is happening to me, I promise you God wants to do something in me. Now, now, what we all do is say, I, you know, God, just, you just got to get me out of this mess. It was C.S. Lewis who said we should change that and say, instead of saying, God, get me out of this mess, we should say, God, what can I get out of this mess? God wants to teach us something. So if you take something to God, I, I, promise, I think I've proved this in the scriptures. If there's something happening to you and you take it to God, you know what God's going to do? God's going to say, now, let's, let's grow in this. Let's learn something out of this. And we're going to be like, no, no, I just need you to. I just need you to take this away from me. God's going to say, no, I, I want you to learn something in this. We're going, we're going to grow out of this. And you're like, N I can go to heaven dumb as a stump. I just, want, I just want, you to take this, I want you to take this away from me. I don't need another lesson. And God says, no, no, I, I want you to grow out of this. Because it's in, it's, it's in that trying of our faith. It's in those difficult times that we, that we are developed perseverance. And that perseverance that we lean on God and we trust God. And so here's, a, here's a, an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, Holly, Holly uh, we, we have two children, and when, when Mad Madeline was our first, and we go to the hospital over here at Winchester Medical Center, and, and Holly, Holly pushes for like four or five hours. What? No, that was Fredericksburg. So you push us for like four or five hours. Micah was born here. Push, I'm just, uh, anyway. So, so we're, at, we're at Mary Washington Hospital in Fredericksburg. And she pushes for like four and a half, five hours. It's just, and, and we end up having to go in the operating room and do cesarean and all of that. But we had gone to those coaching classes. Like, like we went to several of those birthing classes, which is, you should go. If you're a young couple, you should go. But I'm gonna be honest, it's a complete waste of time because when you get in that room, it's like war and you don't use any of it. And if, if I had said to her, and while she's pushing, if I had said to her, you need to listen to me and you need to, if I had tried to coach her, she'd punch me in the face. <laughs> right? But it's probably the only time in our lives, if you've, if you've had children, and especially you, you women with what you go through, but it's probably the only time in our life that in that pain, our, our bodies and our minds aren't telling us that something is wrong. Our bodies and our minds are telling us that it's something beautiful and amazing. And if something were wrong, we would want to fight or we would want to flee or we'd want to get out of it or get away from it. But because it's something beautiful, we push through the pain. And when you push through the pain, the joy of the pain is revealed. And it's the birth of your child. And because we are God's children, we can rest assured 
that even if it's the most painful thing we've ever experienced with God, I don't know how he'll do it. Don't, don't ask me how he does it. I just know he's good at turning beauty from ashes, that he's good at bringing dancing out of our mourning, that he's good at bringing incredible life-giving things out of immense pain. But we have to push through it. We have to trust him, that he's got us, that he's going to take care of us, that he's going to make those things right. Look at Romans 8, 24 through 25. All around us we observe a pregnant creation. This is the message. I just love this paraphrase. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pains. But it's not only around us, it's within us. The Spirit of God is arousing us within. We're also feeling the birth pains. These sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. That is why waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. We enlarge in the waiting. The, the, you ladies know what I'm talking about. You just, you just the, the baby grows and you, how do you even carry that? How do you even do it? The waiting does not diminish us. The more waiting, more than any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. We are enlarged in the waiting. We, of course, don't see what is enlarging us. But the longer we wait, the larger we become and the more joyful our expectancy. When you, when, when, when you must wait, don't focus on what's, focus rather on what's happening in you, not what's happening to you. What can God do through this? So patient isn't, patience isn't the ability to wait, but it's, it's how you act while you're waiting. Okay? And James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. You have it there in your notes. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Right? Now, I don't, I don't, I don't like practicing that verse. That verse is really hard. That verse isn't easy. Nobody reads that verse and says, that's my favorite verse. Nobody puts James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 on their refrigerator. Right? You just don't, right? Jeremiah 29, 11, yeah, I know the plans I have for you, thoughts, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Nobody puts this on a towel. You don't see a bumper sticker with James chapter, with James chapter 1 on it. But he says, consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, and we're like, no, we shouldn't be jo not joyful in the trial, but we're joyful because we know the testing of our faith produces perseverance, and perseverance is that ability to stand up under it, right? And we're not doing that in our own strength, by the way. But perseverance means that we're willing to stand up under it and, and go through it and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature, mature and complete and lack nothing. God is committed to this. We've got to let him work the process in our lives. So number three, and I'm done. Even our very best cannot possibly compare to anything God has in mind. I, I have this, I, I think I've already preached it here. I don't, have it, I don't have my iPad with me. I think I've already preached it here. I have this message that I preach called the God of the impossible. That impossible is God's starting point. And so one of the first things I talk about is that when God needed a family through whom to send his son into the world to take on the sins of the world, die on the cross, buried in a grave, rose, rose again, ascended to the heavens, right? When he sent his son into the world to take back everything that had been surrendered by Adam and Eve, he, he starts with this, this same, can I say it this way? This same, because they're really old. They're 190, okay? So he starts with this old man and this old woman. It's impossible. That was his starting point. And you know what? When God started with them, what he had in mind wasn't that he would just give them a baby, but that he would build a nation. Who in the right mind? Now, I do premarital mentoring here along, along with our other pastors. I've had couples come in and sit down and say, and they're usually the young ones. They come in and they say, we want to have eight children. <laughs> right, ease up, buddy. 18 divided by, you know, and, and so we'll talk about it. We laugh about it and things like that. And, 
I don't try and talk them out of it. I just try and give them a little reality check. Let's just have one first, see how that goes for you, right? And uh, then you can rethink it. And uh, so, so, so every, every now and again, I'll, I'll, have, I'll have those that say, you know, I want to I, I have X number of kids or, you know, something like that. I, you know, I've never had anybody say, you know, what we're, what we're trying to do here is build ourselves a nation. <laughs> and nobody, wakes, nobody says, hey, if you and I get married, we're going to have some pretty kids. We'll make a nation. Will you come make a nation with me? You're not going to get married if that's, your, if that's your line. You need to change it, right? And so, so, so when God wants to build, when God needs a family, he, does, he, doesn't, he doesn't start. He starts with something that is completely impossible in man's eyes. And then who, who builds it? How, how do you build a nation? And yet look at what he's done. Look, look, look at how he's made good on his promise. In, in fact, I don't know if it'll come out in this week's message, but um, Mark, Hitchcock, Mark Hitchcock is an author, and it's a book that he wrote, and one of the quotes that I found in my study that Mark Hitchcock says is that Israel is the only nation that God deeded land to. So, so he makes this promise of the seed. I'm gonna, I'm gonna send the seed, right? Abraham, through you, all the world will be blessed, not because of Abraham, but because of who was coming through Abraham, Jesus. Through you, all, all the world will be blessed, not Abraham, Jesus. He says to Abraham, I am your exceeding great reward. Okay, I make your name great, but you're going to be great, not because of what you do, but because of the lineage you have, because the one that's coming through your lineage. That's the promise of the seed, but the other one is the promise of land. And where Israel is bombing now, that's, that's part of the land that God promised. You know, they, they were deeded land by God that includes some of Egypt. Did you know that? So here's the deal. God made a promise, and if he made a promise to provide for the seed, then we can count on him to make a promise and fulfill the promise of the land as well. That land is theirs. It's not political. It's biblical. It's godly. And I just say that to say this, that God starts with these, impo- like impossible's God's starting point. Like if we say to God, this is impossible, he's like, great, I can do that. If we say, God, I can figure this out, I got it. God's like, go ahead. But when we bring the impossible to God and we trust God, God does incredible things. And the reality is is that our very best, the thing that we can craft in our mind, what, 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 what Sarah thought Hagar could produce was nothing like holding that little bundle of laughter and what God has done. Isaiah 64, verse 4, Since before time began, no one has ever imagined nor ear heard No, I seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. God has so much better plan than you and I could ever imagine if we're willing to wait for it. But we have to be willing to wait for it. Amen?